feet of the chain running. And how do you do that? Four, six seconds, 28, 20 feet, everything you got. Everything you got. Turn that shit up. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Welcome to the Scoop World Order. It is Tuesday night. We are on the grind. There is a lot of big news coming out of the Woody Hayes and out of the recruiting world. Uh, Ohio State is finishing up their week of spring ball. We have a little bit of uh, intel on that. Uh, Spring ball is on and popping next week. They're going to knock some of the rust off. uh, Before they take a little break and go on spring break, they're going to knock out all of their non-padded practices uh, before they head out for a week. And then uh, once they get back from spring break, it is fully padded. Uh, physical work expected. So uh, that's when it really uh, becomes uh, nut cutting time, so to speak. Uh, Really excited about what's going on. Uh, We are going to break down the number one junior in America. He is a humongous prospect, 6'6", offensive tackle, pure left tackle, uh, a guy that we desperately need and a guy that is coming up to Ohio State for our spring game weekend, which just so happens to be the weekend that most schools are having their spring game. So that weekend, he will be in Columbus, and we need 100,000 people to show up. We need nice weather. We need to have a big game, uh, and we need Ryan Day and Justin Fry to make a huge impression on this young man. So this will be a huge, huge deal. Uh, he has the longest highlight tape I've ever seen, so we're going to dive into that and break some of that down for you guys tonight. We're also going to take your questions. So as always, thank you guys so much. We love you guys tuning in live. Uh, again, if you enjoy our live shows, click that alert on our page. You'll get a little notification when we go live on your phone, on your iPad, on your TV, whatever uh, you guys like to watch us on. Uh, I have a lot of people that are on their smart TVs right now watching this. So we appreciate you guys They're giving us the feedback that you guys like to watch it on your TV set. Uh, I love that. Uh, if you enjoy this content, click like. Uh, the likes are huge for us. You guys don't realize how much that helps our videos. So uh, liking, commenting, uh, you know, who is the, the guy that you want most in the 2024 class. And this is going to be a 2025. I can't believe I'm already saying 2025, but that is where we are at in recruiting. So, uh, you know, comment where you're from, shout out where you're from in the comments down below. I love when you guys do that as always, that is always super cool to see where you guys are watching from. Uh, again, a lot of Florida, a lot of Ohio, a lot of, uh, California, Missouri, uh, Chicago land area, New York, uh, And then, you know, other countries. So it's been really cool. So appreciate you guys doing that as always. Uh, We're going to dig into this one. I think you guys are going to love this episode. So keep it locked right here. Going to bring in my good friend, Nevada Buck. Nevada, how are you tonight? Good, man. Not not every day. We're talking about the number one offensive tackle in in the country and and visiting Ohio State. So it's a good day. It was was a good day that became a really good day. So uh, very excited about that. And just a few days to start of spring football as well. So lots to be thankful for uh, today, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're going to get into to, uh, some David uh, Sanders in a second. He is a freaky, freaky kid. He is a giant kid. Um, he's at the Under Armour Combine at this past weekend. Uh, he's just, he just stands out because he's so big. He's so fluid, super lean, um, no fat on this kid, uh, being as tall as he is, as angular as he is. Once he fills out, and really hits the weight room. I think he's really going to be uh, just a tremendous player. He's got a lot of upside, uh, and it's going to be really exciting to see what he does. Uh, Nevada, of all the tackles that we've recruited over the years, who were some of the guys that you thought were the surest things and some of the guys that you thought would be uh, early starters and big-time contributors at Ohio State? Well, you know, it, the offensive line position has always been the toughest to project, and, you know, I, I think I've probably been you know the most wrong uh, about some of the kids. I mean, you know, we've, we've talked, you know, about Connor Smith, you know, a kid that I was convinced was going to be a, not only a good player in, in, in college, but I thought he'd be a you know, terrific player in the NFL and it never really amounted to anything. And there's other kids that I just did not understand the offers or at, at the time with the offers were much panned and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I mean, Daryl Baldwin, I mean, Dar- Dar- the fact that Daryl Baldwin was a starter on our national championship team, is still one of the most stunning things I've ever seen because it's just, you know, that that was a a defense. He was a de- recruited as a defensive player, a three-star defensive player. Nobody wanted him. The fans hated him, and he ends up starting our national championship team. So, hey, offensive line is tough to uh, predict, you know, project, but five stars are five stars, and they don't come along every day. And um, you know, I just I have an idea for what Ohio State could do to close the deal with him at the spring game. On, on August 14th and 15th, bring in Coach Stud to be the closer. 
This is I'm, I'm thinking Coach Stud, he, he closed five stars uh, in five, five straight recruiting cycles. And Ohio State, since he's left, has been unable to get it done. So why not bring him back? Bring him back as a special just for that one weekend and let him do his match, let him do the stud magic and uh, bring this guy home. So it's just an idea. I'm just going to float it out there. And I know the Ohio State people listen to this these podcasts every day. So jot this one down. Nevada Buck says, roll in Coach Stud, bad back and all. Let him close the deal on, on, on April 14th, and uh, and let's get her done. Should we build a statue of Stud? I mean, it'd probably take a lot of bronze to make his body, but I think that'd be kind of hilarious given how many five-stars he closed over the years. Uh, man, I didn't know that was the turn we were going to take this early in the podcast, but that's pretty that's pretty fantastic. Um, uh, in, in all seriousness, you know, we did have a pretty amazing run of five stars uh, for a hot minute, starting with, uh, you know, we had Nick Petit Frere, we had Harriet Miller, um, Paris, you know, uh, Donnie Jackson. And and the thing is, is if you look at these recruiting rankings, there aren't many five stars. So it's not like there's 15 a class. There's like four in the entire country. And you got to beat Bama, Georgia, you know, Clemson, you got to beat the big dogs for the five stars. So it's tough. And most of them are in the South. I mean, Paris is the only kid that was an Ohio five star and everybody else. We had to go get, we had to go get Harry out of Georgia. We had to go get Nick Petit out of Tampa. We had to go get Donnie out of Texas, you know? So those are fist fights, man. Those are tough wins. And when you win, you got to celebrate. I mean, I think the only five star offensive lineman that I played with was Booney. Uh, Alex is a five-star kid from St. Ed's and I don't know if he finished as a five-star. I think he might've been a five-star at the end, but he, you know, he was a guy that was easily the most heralded guy I played with. And, uh, you know, there's, there's just not a lot of them on the earth. I mean, even this David, this David Sanders kid, according to rivals is a four-star, but he's the number one player in the country. So that might be a little low and they might need to be adjusting it. So, uh, it's going to be interesting, but yeah, this is going to be a guy that, uh, it's funny people are saying offer him money. I was like, yeah, this. I mean, I don't know if this guy's an NIL kid or not, but you know, this, if there's ever a guy that I'd give money to, it'd be this one. Um, so we're gonna get into some of his tape because this is a long. This is like a 16 minute highlight reel. Most of these highlight tapes that we watch are about four or five minutes. Um, kid was all state. Obviously, he's from North Carolina, so that's not the same as being all state in Georgia or Texas or Florida. But you know, you can see his fluidity. He's the backside tackle. He was playing left tackle. Um, teams love running this counter play, um, you know, where you pull both, you pull the guard, uh, the guard kicks out, you know, the tackle walls around. Um, and again, like the, uh, it's funny cause the end, you know, he wrong arms down inside. So there really isn't anybody for him. You know, so he gets hooked right away and he's just kind of out on easy street and he just, I think he just kills this guy. Yeah. He gets a hold of him, pancakes him again. This is. You know, when you're when you're a linebacker and, and this guy locks onto you, because the advantage of being six six is your arms are just so long that once you get a lockout on this kid, it's basically curtains. But this is, you know, for a young kid, a light kid, he's probably two forty five ish, maybe um, two fifty. I mean, he's really like you can see how lean he is playing left tackle. Like he looks like a like a small forward on a basketball team. But he loves to put guys in the dirt, which is great, or the astroturf, as you can see there. But super light on his feet. Nevada, we're three plays in. Is he a taker? Do we need to get stud out of retirement to bring him into the fold? Yeah, no, he looks he looks like a good one. I mean, he looks like a good you know, he looks like a good one. He he's got that nasty in him. Um, and like you said, you know, you can see this kid gonna, gonna be playing in the future, you know, you know, 295, 300, 305, he's, and he's still gonna look pretty slight and that he's got that nice big frame. So yeah, I'll say this is a sophomore. Uh, in North Carolina, North Carolina football is not bad, and, and uh, that's that's really saying something. The kid's special, and uh, really likes Ohio State. So this is uh, this is one that we can definitely going to be keeping an eye on here for the next fifteen months for sure. Yeah, he's he's the probably the best mover I've seen at tackle. Now, granted, he's really light. Uh, he's more kind of like a big tight end running around out here, but he is ultra fluid. Like you just see how he releases on this. This is just a little tunnel screen here, you know, and obviously. I think that, you know, his team is much better, but, you know, he releases flat, flat. There's really nobody home here. I mean, there's two guys on one, and he puts his guy in the dirt um, or here. And again, that's the thing is, like, you know, his highlight film is long, and so far every single play is putting guys in the in the ground, which is uh, which is great, especially as, as lean and small as he is. And the fact that he's a true sophomore doing this, like, 
what's he going to be like this year when he's probably going to be 275? You know, I mean, it's going to be scary to see um, how good he gets when he adds some some muscle. Again, you know, he's just a lean guy. And again, I don't know. You know, I mean, I don't know how good the competition is because, yeah, but he gets under this guy, man, and he's he's putting these guys in the dirt. You know, I mean, I a guy that's this good, I even let him. I'd even let him wear a hand towel, even though he's a tackle. Like you know, tackles don't really need to wear hand towels; they just kind of do that for swag. But uh, I wouldn't let a t- my tackle wear one unless uh, he was this good. But uh, he puts them right in the dirt, and again, like you love these guys that are this athletic, but they're also nasty because he loves to finish. He's a really good puller too. I mean, on the backside when you. You run these little tackle dart plays. Is this a full counter? Is there a guard coming too? Looks like, yeah, the guard's coming too. They, they like running this counter play where they've got guard pull and kick, and then you've got the tackle um, kind of wrapping around for whatever's left. And, you know, that's that's really tough to do when the guy – and again, <laughs> it's like these guys is like a cheat code. I mean, this is – that's like the – like, yeah, that's like his version of the Heisman pose is like he's got – He's burying the guy. Uh, the guy's heels are up in the air like this, and he's just planting the dude in the ground. I mean, it's almost it's almost kind of funny how many plays there are where he gets those kill shots in on these guys. Um, but yeah, I was watching. It's funny. Something I think I'm going to do is I'm going to bring back some some tape of some of the best guys I evaluated or some of the best films I've seen because I still think the best tackle film I've seen was Tunsil. Laramie Tunsil, he went to Ole Miss. Obviously, he's the, the gas mask guy, and he was the number one player in the country that you're hiking up at. I remember watching his tape and I was like, yeah, this guy's going to be just an automatic first round pick, number one overall pick. And you know, he was like clowny. Those are like two guys that you watch them one time and you're like, these guys, I mean, unless they blow out both their ACLs twice, they're not, they're, you know, they're going to be top five picks. And, you know, Tonsil should have been the first pick in that draft. And he ended up being, I think like eight or nine. I uh, slid down to, uh, to Tennessee. Uh, and, and somehow Jack Conklin went ahead of him, which is insane, but it is what it is. But yeah, I, I love this kid's film. He is coming up uh, for the spring game weekend, which I thought was really notable because most of the good programs have their spring game on April 15th. And the reason that they do that is because that next day, uh, excuse me, not the 15th, 16th, the 17th, I believe, uh, is the first day that you're allowed to be on the road as a coaching staff for recruiting um, so every like USC announced they're on the 15th. Most of these schools are going to be on the 15th or earlier. Uh, cause if you do it on the 23rd, the following Saturday, you literally miss an entire week of recruiting. So, you know, you want to be the first guys out on the road. Uh, if you're going to see a kid like this, you know, if you're, if you're Justin Fry, you want to be at this kid's high school Monday morning at 7am on the first day, just so you can say, Hey, I, I came and saw you first. And, uh, you know, you want to send Ryan Day down to see you know, some of these really good kids in North Carolina and Georgia uh, just so you can make the inroads. Uh, Nevada, who are some of the best recruits that you've you've seen on tape or some of the guys you remember through the years? I mean, because I know sometimes people like going down memory lane and seeing some of the, the good guys. Was that uh... – <laughs> that's your, that was, that's your that critic. Was, that, was, that was Kirby. That was that Kirby. Was... Kirby says hello. Kirby says hello. <laughs> Kirby, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Named after the late great Kirby Puckett. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, who are some of the guys that you you've seen and evaluated over the years that you just knew were going to be surefire stars? Well, like you know, it, it, it's funny because I like to talk about some of the kids that left Ohio, like like Jackson Carmen. I, I'll talk about Jackson Carmen. Jackson's been was kind of an interesting one because you know I just never really saw it with him. You know, like I I I. Mm-hmm. I thought he was okay in high school i thought he was okay in college and then in 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 the pros like sometimes he has some good games sometimes he has some some bad games but that's an example where it's just so hard to tell with the bigs you know you don't know with these big guys because you know a lot of times you're watching you know like we're watching this tape right now we're watching he's literally a head taller than all these kids he's playing against right now and so the question is when he gets up against a defense then who's six foot six you know, 250 pounds and, and can run like a deer. Can he still do the same? I'm going to put you on your butt and, and run you off the field a la Michael Orr in the, uh, in the blind side. So, you know, it's, it's so hard, but you know, some of the, the, you know, I, I like some of the, 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 the great high school tapes of, of kids. You go back there and, you know, one of your favorite kids, the, the kid that you, uh, you love to death is Chantrell Henderson. 
You know, I, I liked watching his, his <laughs> highlight tape. He had a, it had a great soundtrack to it. It had, it had sound effects. It had little uh, graphics and little bombs and booms uh, and stuff like that in it. And it, that, that was one of my that was one of my favorites of all time. You got you have a few minutes to go back and find the Sean Troy Henderson highlight tape, and uh, it was uh, that was quite a that was quite a highlight tape. He was walking a bunch of little hockey players in Minnesota. It was hilarious. I was like, this guy's like six foot eight and. I think Tom Lemming had the greatest line ever. He's like, he said like, he's a combination of if you could splice or mix like Jonathan Ogden and Orlando Pace together, you'd get Sean Charles Henderson. And I was like, are you serious with that? Like, how could you ever say that about a kid who's 17? Like, you know, you take the two greatest tackles that ever lived and then you get Sean Trell. I'm like, you know, and the kid shows up, he's a turd. I remember he was on Miami in 2010 because he went to SC they got hit with the death penalty, you know, Pete Carroll hit the, the golden parachute on out of town. And then uh, I, I remember um, he transferred to Miami immediately because we, we played the Hurricanes in the shoe in 2010. And I remember seeing him and, you know, he's big, but he had like this big, fat, dumpy body and this big, like dopey face. And I was like, is that guy really going to be that good? You know, and then he ends up, you know, like being a rotational guy his last year at Miami and he just doesn't ever really do anything you know he, he got drafted in the nfl like the sixth or seventh round late just because of his size and because of his i guess his upside from high school i, th- I think there's some guys that get just get drafted because they were phenoms in high school and they try to make him into nfl guys but he just he didn't have it and it was just one of those weird things where you know sometimes when some of these guys are just big time uh prima donnas especially when they're big guys like when they're offensive linemen it like never works. There's always going to be like a big question mark or you know, for whatever reason, like I've just, I've seen this movie before and I'm just not a fan of it. And, and again, I, maybe I'm just boring and old and whatever, but I, I, I just, I genuinely think when, when these guys like Hal dots, like nice kid, but you know, he did like this big commitment ceremony and a big song and whatever. And like, you know, and, and Taylor Decker just like quietly committed, committed and flipped from Notre Dame no big press conference, no big ballyhood thing. And Taylor came in day one, was a worker bee, uh, graduated early, was straight uh, business over oh, switching over to defense now for for our dude. Um, well, well, no, no, wait a second. Let me, I, I just want to say one thing though. You know, yeah. it's when when Kyle Dotson committed to Ohio State. How excited was Urban Meyer about that one? I mean, Urban Meyer. Oh God, was, it was it was almost that, comical. Uh, I mean, he was over the moon excited. You're oh, talking God. about Urban Meyer. I mean, like Urban Meyer, hate Urban Meyer, whatever. I mean, Urban Meyer is on the Mount Rushmore of great coaches. Clearly, yeah. you know, maybe the greatest recruiter that's ever walked the sidelines. If not, he's definitely in the top three or four. And he was over the moon about getting Kyle Dodson, and Kyle Dodson couldn't play. So it just goes yeah. to show you how tough this is for evaluators, for coaches, for fans, for anybody to, to pick this stuff up. And at the end of the day, all you're really left with on any of this stuff is how how well do people play? You know, how well do mm-hmm. they play once they get or how do they develop? Because man, projecting is hard. If, if Urban Meyer can miss that bad, then you and I can miss that bad. That you know, and, and not feel terrible about it. Yeah, this is an incredible play right here. Yeah, I mean this kid. I mean this kid. This is a rare bird right here. This is an offensive tackle. He's playing DN here, and he picks off the screen pass and runs it back to the crib. Does he get it all the way back to the crib? Please tell me he outruns all these little guys. Does he outrun the quarterback? Oh, they get him at the five. Yeah, this this is a special dude, man. I like watching his tape. Um, but no, like like again, I I I totally can be wrong on guys too. Like I mean, I, again, I I thought Kyle Kalis was going to be a lot better than he ended up being. He was a guy that was a nice player at Michigan, but he didn't get drafted. Had a short NFL career. Um, I thought Taylor would be good. Um, I wasn't sure if he was first round good, but I knew that he'd be a really good. Like I thought he'd be an All Big Ten player um with with that could that could hit all american he did hit all american hit first round um you know i thought elf line would be really good uh is, you know so again it's some of these kids they just got it and uh a lot of it is it happens kind of in the fires of of late season late practices where you know urban we kind of scrimmage the young guys at the end of practice all the young the, the good guys go in and when we'd have our full pad days, we'd keep the young guys out and do some one-on-one drills where it'd be like live blocking Pat offline versus Chris Carter. Chris Carter weighed 380 pounds and Pat was probably 285 and 
Pat would get his hands in and just dump Chris right on his head. And Pat didn't want, or and Chris didn't want anything else. And that showed like elite explosion and flexibility and, and just nastiness. And, and I remember coach Meyer asked me, he said, you think, you think offline is going to be really good. And I was like, yeah, I do. I really, I really believe that kid's got what it takes. And this was a kid that urban was ready to flush down the toilet. Cause you know, Pat had, he had an incident in the off season. It was really, you know, it wasn't bad, but it was bad enough. Urban was already like, if you're already kind of a three-star Ohio kid and, and urban, you know, it, it, it's like you have like one life. You weren't a cat that had nine lives. You're like a cat that had one life. So, you know, Pat got left off the 105 coming in his freshman year, which is something that never happens to scholarship guys. He had a surgery on his, uh, like on his back. Um, so he was, I mean, he was at death's door kind of before he even started. And then that kid just fought and worked and he was a kid that, you know, he, he missed all the camp cause he, he, he was recovering from surgery. I was meeting with him during my lunch break, which, you know, I didn't really have lunch break. I had like a 30 minute break where I would go with him and do the install in a separate room. Cause he wasn't even allowed to be in our meetings. So that's a little like urban thought of that guy when he first got there. So like, I mean, you know, it was a long climb to the top of, you know, becoming a, a consensus all American and, you know, winning the Remington and, you know, kind of all the, all the really cool stuff that he achieved, you know, throughout his career. He's still in the league. I mean, he's, he's having a nice year. Uh, just got his wife pregnant. So congrats. He married Jim Lachey's daughter. So congrats to Pat and Emily. So it's, it's really cool. Like, cause I, I loved Pat. I always had a, a, a real fondness for Pat and uh, it's really cool to see what he's been able to do in his career um, when not a lot of people believed in them, you know, and sometimes the only guy that really matters in terms of belief is you. <laughs> so like if, if everybody else doesn't believe in you, as long as Pat believed in Pat, he was going to be straight. So, but yeah, I, um, I love watching this kid's tape though. I mean, his defensive highlights are actually longer than his offensive highlights. I'm actually going to rewind it and go back to some of the offensive stuff and break it down a little bit cleaner. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I, I think evaluating offensive line is tough because guys, you know, no, there isn't a position where the where body types change more than offensive line. There's guys that, like Mark Nave, has lost like 40 pounds. You know, he looked real jiggly and fat, and he's really worked hard to to get a lot of that bad weight off to uh to kind of recalibrate his body. Um, and that's something that a lot of these kids deal with. A lot of these kids, they're young, seventh, eighth grade. They put on a lot of bad weight from bad diet, not working out, and you know they're 330, but they're a very you know, they're 35% body fat. So that doesn't work in college football. And as you get into more high performance training, you realize that it is terrible to carry that kind of weight around because it makes everything way harder to do. Like conditioning is miserable. You know, going to football camps is miserable. Uh, you know, coaches kind of look down on, you know, that soft body because it shows a lack of discipline. So he's lost a lot of weight. He's reshaping his body. He's working hard. Um, and then there's kids that are just naturally leaner, like, like this kid, like David Sanders, who's 250 and he's wiry, but you know, this kid will be 320, and he'll probably be, you know, 14% body fat and just be a specimen. So it's always cool to see how these kids grow year over year as they progress through weight training. Uh, they get more adapt at weight training. Cause you know, a lot of these kids, you gotta remember, they start lifting when they're in probably eighth grade or so you know if you're a bigger kid you don't want to lift much earlier than that because you don't want to disrupt your growth plates but um you know these kids they get stronger uh some are in better programs than others in terms of uh how progressive their weight their weight training is like i was blessed that i was in a fantastic weight program we had in school weightlifting at, at perry high school and and our our weightlifting was no joke urban meyer said he'd never seen anything like how hard we worked out um during our 40 minute uh like it was, it was kind of like we had like gym for every single semester, even though we only got credit for it for one semester out of the whole time we were in high school, but our high school coach did not screw around. And it was, uh, it was great for me because I got to reap all the rewards of the hard work. Um, and I just assumed everybody worked like that, but not everybody does Nevada, you know, as we, um, as we get a little closer to wrapping this thing up, what, uh, what do you want out of this offensive line this spring? I think this is something that, you know, people are, are really, they're nervous about corners. They're nervous about O-line. Uh, I think that we're getting a lot of good tackles to come visit, which is great. Yeah, we got to get some of them committed. But, um, you know, again, I'm like you. I have no worries on the O-line. I think the O-line is going to be fine. Um, but what would be a, a good, solid spring showing for the offensive line? Would it be to get the starters kind of filled out? Would it be to get some guys rotated in? Uh, what, what would be your prognosis for a successful spring? Well, I think – 
what I'm going to be really watching is, is can we pass block? Because, because yeah. you know, we'll be able to run block. We'll be able to run block. And, you know, it's, the question is, can we protect the quarterback? Can we keep the quarterback upright? Can we give him some time? Because that's really the only way that this OSU offense is going to, you know, have difficulties come the fall. So I'm just going to be watching, do we have five guys out there that have, and, and that have any type of cohesion that can kind of you know, can protect the edge, that it's not just a jailbreak every time, that we don't just look, you know, stiff and, and you know, like, like you know, pylons out there where our defensive guys are running through like turnstiles. So if we can pass, if we can pass protect in the spring, that this fall is going to be every bit as good as we think it's going to be. That's what, that's going to be the key indicator for me. That's going to be the key metric. And, uh, I, I, I think they're going to put on a great tune. I, I've, I've said it before. I think it's going to be 10, 11 guys deep in terms of this group. I think there's going to be a lot of guys that are going to be participating, a lot of guys that are going to be contributing, a lot of guys that are going to be flashing on the offensive line. And I think it's going to be a heck of a battle. So he's going to be the starting five. So I think Fry's got his work cut out for him. Um, and, and all the while, along parallel tracks, we're hoping that someday Justin Fry lands a five-star offensive lineman like, like, uh, like Stud used to do with regularity. So if Justin, if Fry, Fry gonna fry, and Fry gonna bring home uh bring home the bacon. If Fry's gonna fry it up and bring us a number one kid in America. It starts on uh April fourteenth or fifteenth or whatever that weekend is with the spring game, and he's got his he's got his shop this uh this big stud out of North Carolina. So let's get her, get her done. All right, Nevada. Here we go, Dave Rice. This is the question. This is one of the ones I put on the tee for you. He says, we haven't been able to run block in short yardage and goal line in at least two seasons. Why is that, Nevada? <laughs> because we run zone read action with a quarterback who never keeps. So we slow the play down at the match point, and we have a quarterback who's never a, a threat to keep the ball, and that's why we struggle. Singular, singular reason. Predictability by formation, predictability by down and distance, predictability with a quarterback that doesn't present any type of running threat that will kill you in short yardage and in the red zone period end easy fix yeah it's it's essentially it'd be like if we ran play action pass and we never ran the ball ever you know it's like it's like when we run play action on third and 25 or something they know we're not going to run the ball but we still do the little zone read play fake but yeah i mean that's really what it is i mean you got to remember back in the olden days, and I'm not saying what's right or wrong or indifferent or whatever, but back in the olden days of of trestle ball with Greg Krenzel and Troy and these guys, there, you know, the zone read didn't exist back then. So when you ran plays, everybody had to be blocked. What changed everything is the zone read, where instead of blocking a backside defensive end or linebacker, you would read them. You know, so if the guy crashes down and takes the running back, you pull it as the quarterback, and if he stay static which is basically where he just kind of stands there you hand it to the running back and he runs in the a gap so you know what teams do now that they realize that we never ever run the quarterback is they just crash every time so it's like a free tackle for loss 90 percent of the time unless the guy's just a skunk and he's too slow to get there or our guy's just a bull and he could break an arm tackle but you know when you play a good team you know they figure out eventually hey you know we're never gonna actually run the quarterback so you know, again, if if you try to do trickery and that kind of thing and you never actually, you know, do the opposite of 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 handing the ball, which is keeping it with the quarterback, eventually teams figure that out. And so that's why we run some of the stuff in short yardage and it's just putrid because, you know, there's a free hitter uh, essentially because we, you know, when we have a, a pull read, we never pull the ball because it's probably a called a called give and, you know, Heaven forbid a quarterback ever takes a hit, you know, because they're made out of porcelain. But um, I don't know. I just I, I watched like what Justin Fields did in the NFL. Justin Fields should have been a Pro Bowler this year. He was unbelievable, and it was all because he ran the ball. You know, I mean, he he carried Chicago, which is a terrible team. They literally had the worst record in the NFL, the worst skill, the worst O line, the worst infrastructure, and they actually beat good teams because Justin Fields is just that good. They beat the San Francisco 49ers head the best defense in the in the entire NFL because of Justin Fields' legs. So, you know, when you get down to – you go to the big house, you go to at Wisconsin, when you really need it, 
that's what gets it for you. Like I lived through, you know, I had Terrell Pryor in 2010 when I was a, when I was a quality control coach there, Terrell beat Iowa with his legs. You know, I mean, like that was, it was a miracle. You know, if, if Terrell doesn't scramble, we have no chance, you know? So when everything's covered, everything's, you know, sticky, then, you know, that run is still there. Like, I mean, you look at, uh, again, we're, we're rushing some of these, some of these uh, defensive plays from David Sanders, but uh, you know, the, the play where CJ had his long scramble for 30 ish yards, everybody was covered. I mean, there wasn't a, there wasn't a foot of separation by any of our receivers, including a Mecca, uh, Julian, you know, all the, all the other receivers were covered and there was just a massive amount of grass in the middle of the field. And you're just like, Holy cow. Like, thank God he finally ran. So that's something that we're gonna have to do. Um, uh, what other questions we got? Sue, you got anything? Dave, you got anything? We've got a pretty good crew on tonight. Appreciate all you guys tuning in. Um, last week, winter conditioning, I got some really good feedback from the guys. Uh, you know, some of my guys are getting a little skinnier. They're a little fat last year, a little heavy last year, a little heavy footed. So, uh, uh, some of our, our defensive front guys are down significant amounts of weight just because they want to be quicker. Uh, they want to be able to, to get off the ball a little bit better. So um, look for that. It's going to be interesting because I think that uh, JT, especially and Jack, they're really focused on pass rush because they know if they want to play in the league and they want to play defensive end in the league, they get up that sack total a little bit. So uh, they're going to get after it um, in the spring. And that's the matchup I'm excited for is, is these tackles versus two ends that, again, those ends are used to going against Paris and Dewan, and now they're going to be going against Zen Mikulski and and Josh Fryer. So that's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, can the offense function with those guys? Can our tackle step up and block those guys? Uh, it'll be fascinating in my opinion. Um, anything else, Nevada? Uh, we got a, uh, oh, here we go. Here we go. We got some Jaden Davis, Julian saying air Nolan. Um, I'll take this one just because I got some Intel on this. I think it's Jay. It's, I think it's going to be Jaden Davis. I mean, I know that sounds crazy because we, uh, you know, we, we basically curbed him and left him at the altar, uh, last year for, 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 I'll never forget the Dylan Rayola week when leading up to that spring game, when I talked to the Rayolas and they said, they're not coming for the spring game. Bill Green reported that they were coming for the spring game. I called the real as they said, oh, now we are coming to the spring game. This is like over the course of 24 hours, they did a complete 180. And it was like I said, it was kind of like the OK Corral, where all of a sudden, Jane Davis is showing up, the real are showing up. It's going to be a rumble in the jungle, like between the two of them to see who gets the offer and see who can commit the fastest to Ryan Day. And, uh, you know, the real basically said, hey, we're coming to commit, you know, silently, you know, but tell Jane Davis to go fly a kite. And they did. So the real show up, they commit silently and then they you know they they do the uh you know they, they tell Jaden davis to buzz off and Jaden davis was the guy that we thought we were going to get all along so now you know <laughs> dylan Riola, you know buzzes off and he doesn't even have an offer from us anymore and now we're trying to get back in with Jaden davis um i think plan c is uh is is probably air um julian saying is, is this an interesting one just because you know he's a guy that in, the, or excuse me, Bam already has two quarterbacks in the class before him. Could be the lost guy. Could be a guy that gets flipped. Um, but no, I, I think Jaden Davis at this point is in the lead to be the quarterback. You know, and again, we have a long way to go before signing day, and a lot of things can happen. And you know, based on how crazy it was with, you know, this time last year, Dylan Ariola was you know was trending towards being a Buckeye, and then you know, spring game obviously commits to Ryan Day. So uh, it's crazy, Nevada. You've been around some crazy recruiting stuff. Where does the Dylan Rayola saga rank amongst like the kind of the craziest of of being Mr. Buckeye, being Mr. Class Leader, and then pulling the e brake and and throwing the parachute, and jumping out of the plane, kind of in the middle of the night? Where does that rank for you? I, I mean, honestly, it's it's. I'm not even sure it's in the top five of the last few years, man. I mean, think think about what we've had. We've had we've had Quinn Ewers. The number one player, <laughs> the highest rated player of all time, reclassify, come to Ohio State, get left off the travel squad. They, they sent him at home. Uh, who, who was the legendary quarterback that they traveled ahead of him? I'm, I'm trying to think of the name. Jagger right Laroe, who went, oh, he went yeah. and played for, he went and played for Coach Prime at Jackson State last year. Yeah, Jagger, Jagger Laroe. 
they 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 travel him and, and, and I mean the Quinn Ewers thing was like was absolutely nutty, and uh, you know I mean Dylan's thing is not even like it was it was kind of good it was kind of good but I mean look I don't think Dylan Rayl is that good I'll I'll say it everybody else is going to dance around I I didn't think he was that great when they offered him but you know everybody was excited and everybody's jumping up and down so you're like hey okay maybe I'm missing something but you know. I, I think they got shut out the championship game in Arizona this year, or there's only scored seven points or, I mean, they, they weren't good. Uh, you know, and, and when you're the number one player in America, you would hope you could win the Arizona championship or, or at least put up some points. So, uh, yeah, I, I didn't think he was all that. I didn't think he was all that at the time, but Hey, now, uh, now we're, we're back to Jaden Davis. And, and if it's not Jaden, then we'll go all in on, on, on air and, uh, and be happy with the nickname. <laughs> air. Um, yeah, I, I, I actually met Air and saw Air. Uh, he was down at the South Florida Express uh, tournament. He didn't play the day I was there for some reason. And the quarterback they had stunk. So I I wasn't sure why Air wasn't playing or whatever. But he was there. And, I mean, he was throwing the ball with JJ. And he's a lefty, which is different. I mean, we, I don't think we've had a lefty quarterback since Bell. Sorry. But he can throw the crap out of the ball. I mean, you can hear the ball go by you when he throws it because he throws it so hard. And it was just, it was funny because like I was standing talking to JJ, and you know, you know, they're, they're, you know, Aaron's like, hey, you want to play catch? You know, he's talking to JJ, obviously, not me. And uh, they start playing catch, and like the first ball is like a missile, and I'm like, Jesus! I was, you know, it wasn't like some warm up soft toss. It was like, let me see if I can throw it through your skull. And JJ is funny because he everything he catches is just like just perfect. I mean, there's no bobble, there's nothing, but the guy's got an absolute cannon. Aaron does so. It's going to be interesting to see what we do at quarterback. Yeah, the Ewers not traveling is so – that's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. I'm like, this kid gives up his senior year, and you leave him at the at the Griff so he can sit in his, his apartment after he uh, you know, he gave up kind of everything. So it was – that was bizarre because I, I figured, you know, if there's one thing you should do with a kid like Quinn Ewers, you know, if he reclassifies and he's supposed to be the future and all this, like – you got to take him on these trips, man, and you got to help him learn the offense and get him in walkthroughs and get him involved with the team. And, you know, because not all kids are created equal. Like, if a kid is like a five star, superstar quarterback, like, you got to keep him engaged. You can't leave him at home. You can't say, you know, hey, you know, maybe next trip, especially when you're taking Jagger LaRue, which is, you know, a kid that transferred out anyways. So I don't know. Like, I, again, it is what it is. It doesn't matter. It's either here or no, there. No, but Kirk. No, but Kirk, that, that that was the great thing about it because I, I, you know, the the, the pundits at the time were like, well, we we want to we want to reward the guys that are pe- real Buckeyes with the trip, and I'm like, Jack of the Road transferred oh, anyway, gosh. man. He's not like some guy that was like, you know, Joey Buckeye that was there for all these years. We really loved. Him. Like they took Jagger Laro, left yours at home, and then and then they're shocked when they leave him. And then they try to trash the kid on the way out. So yeah, that that was uh that was that was that was the craziest story. As far as I'm concerned, for Oshu, that was that, that was not a good moment for Iowa State. But we'll move on and uh, look forward and, and uh, to on to better days. Uh, we'll, we'll have a Jagger Larue Appreciation Day sometime. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, it, it was. That, I'll, I'll always shake my head at that one because again, like, what's the reward if you're a kid? Like, here's your reward: you get to be on the travel squad to go to Piscataway and go stand there for the Rutgers game. Like when when I redshirted my freshman year, I didn't want to travel. Like, I didn't even want to go to the games because, like, when I know I wasn't going to play, like, you know, I, you only go to the home games when you're when you're redshirted. But it's like you go there, you get dressed, you warm up and you stand there for three hours and you just feel like a bum because you have no chance of getting in. This is the old days where if you redshirted, you weren't going to play a single play. So now it's different because now these kids can play up to four games and still retain their their redshirt eligibility. But like when I redshirted, you weren't getting in a game. So. You know, it's like after, you know, you are you were uh, um, an ERW, um, yeah, an ERW. That's what Bill Belichick called him. You, you'd eat, you'd ride, and then you'd warm up. And that was it. That was the extent of your day. So, you know, the ERWs are the guys that, you know, they're never going to play. They eat the team meal. They ride the bus over. They warm up for the game. And that's it. And then they just stand there until after the game. And then they shower and they go home and do whatever. But I, you know, like. My freshman year, um, Tim Schaefer got busted for doing something stupid, and they took him off the travel squad, and they traveled me, even though I was redshirted, just as a punishment. 
And I was like, man, I don't want to travel because, like, you know, I, I could hang out in my room and play Xbox or whatever. So I'm not going to play in the game. I'm not really that engaged. And when you go to, you know, to the hotel, you got to take the test and you got to do like all this extra stuff. I'm like, uh, you know, because traveling sucks. You got to go through all the walkthroughs, all the meetings. Like, if you don't travel, you just show up to the game and eat a hot dog on the way in and you're good. But, um, yeah, but, you, but, you know, you just made a great point though. And it is really, you know, huh. the fact now, I, I still remember the famous Sammy Maldonado one where he's out there begging to get put in the game and they put him in it and he he plays one play, runs for a touchdown or whatever it was, and that burned his red shirt for the entire year. And uh, you know, nowadays you can you can play these games and not and not lose the year. And that's uh that's a radical change. That changes everything in terms of the approach and you know. So maybe by your theory, maybe they were doing Quinn a favor by leaving him at home. It was actually a way of rewarding him <laughs> by leaving him home. And they were punishing Jack and LaRue by bringing it. So it's kind oh, of a spy God. versus spy, four-dimensional chess stuff that Ryan Day's doing, man. That was pretty clever. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. Like, like for me, I, I, I just it, – it, it was weird. Like, I mean, I wouldn't want to go to Piscataway, but, yeah, th this is funny. So, Alva Coakley, I like this. Your retro year, all you want to do is sit in the dorm and study. And, and I mean, honestly, like, my retro year – I didn't care because like I knew I wasn't playing the game, so I would like lift super heavy. I would I would do stuff I would never do if I was playing the games. Like I'd be lifting like crazy on Friday and Saturday morning and Sunday. I, I'd lift like you know like Hercules. And you know, and when you're in season playing football normally, like you get like good workouts, but you're not like killing yourself just because you know you got to your body has to be healthy enough to practice. So if you're sore and you're all pumped up from lifting too much like that. That's not good. But that first year, man, I was cranking it out and because I wanted to play. I would go running late night. I could leave the dorm room and I had like there was this there was this chick that I was friends with and we'd go run around campus, like literally put on our headsets and go get some miles in because I didn't have to play. So I didn't care. I'd, you know, I'd stay up late and just do stupid stuff because when you're not playing everything, changes. now when you play, it's like you go to bed early, you eat right. You know, you're supposed to. I mean, I did because I was obsessed with making sure that I had as much energy as I could because football is a very draining game. And to not do it with, with energy is is tough. Um, Sue, so, what are you doing with my, my boy Quinn, Sue? So, Sue so says, they left yours at home to let him know you ain't all that, buddy, and keep reading the playbook. My thing is, like, they should have they should have taken him to Piscataway to teach him the playbook because you've got – you got to understand on these road trips, like you get in to Piscataway or wherever they sit out for Rutgers. And it's like, you're, you have the team meal and then you sit there and, and you watch movies and you have chapel and test review and all this stuff. But that whole time, instead of watching the movie or screwing around in your room, like Corey Dennis could have had Quinn and he could have been tutoring him. And, and you know, I would do that with any young quarterback. I would take him on the road and, and make him walk through stuff with Ryan day. Get him used to the environment. Like, I mean, uh, Trust used to travel Justin Zwick and Troy when they were freshmen. I think in 03, you know, they, they both went up to Michigan just so they could experience the road environment, even though they were, you know, they, they weren't going to play or they're like the number three and four quarterbacks behind uh, Craig and Scotty Mack. But I, I think, you know, what, like when I was in the league and I was a young player, you know, when, when you go and you're, you know, with a team, like they, they you know, they're trying to teach you the playbook. So you'd meet with the O-line coach during the, you know, the time where everybody else is just chilling out in the hotel, watching movies or watching whatever uh, college football games are on that Saturday night. Cause you play on Sundays. So it's uh, I think it's an invaluable time where you can get with some of the young linemen. You can get with some of the guys that maybe aren't as sure about the playbook or sure about their assignments. And you can really grind them. We used to do that all the time. Like we get the young O-linemen together and then, you know, we'd have the veterans come in and we'd go through the test. But the young guys, we'd, we'd make them go through the test with us to make sure they knew their assignments. So um, I think it's one of those things uh, you just, you know, you got to maximize your time because there's no 20-hour rule when, when you go on the road. I mean, the clock turns off as soon as it's, it's competition weekend. So, you know, from Friday to Sunday when you – or Saturday night when you land, like there's no 20-hour rule. So you can, you can meet a thousand times if you want to over two days. Um, so that's something a little different. Well, to that, we've watched this kid's film. He's a fantastic player. I really love his, uh, watching his athleticism. I love him on defense too. I mean, his defensive highlights are fantastic, but, um, you know, we're, we're 
grinding down into spring ball, uh, Buckeye Scoop is exceptionally crazy right now. You broke down some of the analytical stuff we're doing. Uh, got a great report coming on some of the guys that were big winners in winter conditioning. We'll have that up in the next couple of days. Uh, any final stuff? Uh, appreciate you guys tuning in. This is a nice audience tonight. So uh, any uh, any closing stuff as we count down? Uh, we're one week out from spring ball tomorrow, so it's gonna be it's going to be here before we know it. Now, OSU has just had a very, very, very productive winter, and uh, there's been some pretty radical body transformations from some guys that are uh, that are going to lead the first guy off the bus group. So uh, be watching for that the next next couple of days. But yeah, um, some guys have had some big, big winters, poised to have some big springs, and uh, in the 2023 season, it's it's like I said, been a been a very, very good winter for Ohio State, and that usually bodes well for uh, for the upcoming season. So I can't wait. I'm telling you, man, it's now or never for Jaden Ballard. I know we said it all ball practice, but my God, like, I mean, when you have a Mecca and Julian out and you're the guy who's by far the oldest guy on the field, you're going to be running with the ones the entire spring. It is time for him to go, you know, with the amount of speed he has and the fact that he's the fastest guy on the team, you know, which should be terrifying to cornerbacks. And, uh, you know, Kyle McCord's got a big arm, man. If I'm Jaden, I'm not leaving Kyle McCord's side because I, you know, you have that opportunity to build chemistry, potentially move ahead of Julian Fleming and be the Z receiver. Um, I'd do everything I could just because I think that, that Jaden has more ability than Julian, which is crazy because Julian was the number one receiver in the country a few years ago. But he doesn't have the Jets that Jaden does. So I think it's going to be a, it's going to be a very interesting spring. You know, I think Julian really kind of needed this spring and the fact that he's dinged up and he's going to miss spring. Um, I don't think it's a death knell because he obviously finished the year as the number three receiver, but you know, Jaden Ballard's got a big opportunity, man, with Emeka and and uh, you know Marvin will be limited because he's you know, the best player in the country, so he doesn't need to get you know 500 reps during the spring. So I'm sure Ryan will monitor him, but but Jaden does. Jaden needs every rep he can get and see if he can get into the rotation. Um, Nevada, the any guys that you're super excited to hear about in spring? Uh, and then we'll wrap this thing up. Carnell Tate, man, wait till you guys see Carnell Tate really good <laughs> really really good but i mean we should probably go back and show some of his uh high school highlights because he's really really good and he's an alpha man he's he is leading the pack at ohio state and uh, you know if i'm if i'm buying stock i'm buying carnell tate stock yeah i mean that's the, the two guys that we got were jelani thurman and carnell tate those are the two guys that they're they're not scared of anything they're eating up these workouts um they act like pros. They act like they don't act like high school kids that are kind of you know bright eyed and nervous. I mean, th these guys are they're they're different cats now, and I think that there's a big opportunity for Jelani Thurman, especially the way that he blocks because he is a nasty blocker. He's a f I, I think he's you know as talented of a two way tight end in terms of blocking and receiving as we've had in twenty years, but he really. Pound, I mean, he pile drives guys in the running game, which I love. And, you know, if you're going to put Kate at wing or if you're going to leave him at the, as the point guy in the two tight end look, um, it's going to be real interesting to see what they do with some of these guys and uh, where they find them at. But, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think I think Julian is a better blocker. It, I think, honestly, our, our perimeter blocking is not very good, you know, on our wide receivers. I think that's something that kills our running game right now. Um, some of these guys are kind of allergic to contact and you can see it when you watch the coaches film. Some of these guys don't want to get their nails dirty. And I think that's a stark departure from where it was with urban because with urban, he wouldn't have put up with that um, to the degree that it's going on now. But again, these guys are first round picks and they act like first round picks and they block like first round picks. You know, most first, you know, Justin Jefferson's not making $30 million a year to block. So uh, that's kind of why you know you, you put up with it with Marvin Emeka, you know, but some of these guys that aren't Marvin Emeka, they need to go in there and, knock somebody's block off the way San Antonio used to back in the olden days. Um, but I, I think that'll be interesting, uh, Sue. But yeah, I think that something that really kills our, our long running game is not getting the perimeter blocking like we used to. So that's something that, you know, some of these young receivers that want to get on the field, go knock somebody out. Then all of a sudden you'll be, you know, moving your way up the depth chart. So you got something Nevada? Yeah, not just, uh, I, I, Carnell Tate's like a guy like that. He likes to block, eager blocker. Uh, likes to drive guys, and I, I think that's one of the reasons why he, he might see some early action. And um, you know, in, in a, last year we didn't see any of those 
young wide receivers kind of distance themselves this year. I'm saying Carnell's going to be that guy. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be a big spring. And the good thing about the guys being out is Carnell could be with the twos early just because you got two of the big dogs out. You know, Marvin will be limited. So it's kind of like the guys that normally would be with the twos are going to be with the ones. The guys that normally are with the threes are going to be with the twos. And, you know, when the two quarterbacks are, are Devin and McCord and they're rotating between the ones and twos, like Carnell Tate is going to be day one catching balls from Kyle McCord. And normally that's not how it works with a, with a freshman catching balls from the presumptive starter. So uh, I think that'll be fascinating to watch. Um, and I'm excited to see these corners, man. These corners are going to be uh, put to the test, you know, and it's going to be fun to see uh, and hear some of the reports that we get. And I'm excited to see Jack Sawyer and JT at the end. Um, you know, it's time to cut it loose, guys. Year three, uh, you know, Mike Hall, Ty Leak, uh, this this crazy, you know, uh, super, you know, super sophomores, fantastic freshmen. Now it's, you know, just just go get the quarterback juniors i guess i can start some of the J, but i uh i'm excited to see these guys and see them get after the quarterback so um yeah getting Jaden from michigan again like the thing i keep going back to with the quarterback in 24 is you know you're going to be throwing to carnell tate and brandon ennis and jj smith so in, in ryan day's offense with brian hartline calling the plays like i don't know what else you want you know in terms of being on like the the you know, the monorail to first to first round them or the, the bullet train to be in a first round pick. Like you got this offense with that talent and, you know, and our running backs are coming in are fantastic too. I mean, I just, I don't know what else you could, you could possibly want. So we, um, all right. So we're going to wrap this thing up. Uh, any final words, Nevada? Jagger LaRue. That's my final words. That's the last time I'm going to leave with everybody. Jagger LaRue. If we could get Jagger LaRue back to throw to Colonel Tate, and Brandon Innes and J.J. Smith and the Rogers brothers, then I think even Jagger LaRue could salt, throw for 4,000 yards. If you had to win a game and you, it was him or Chug, who are you taking? Ooh. Ooh. Man, uh, that, yeah, that's tough. That's tough. Chug, I'll, I'll, Chug, I'll, Chug, I'm, Chug was a legend I'm, now. I'm going to think about that when I get back to you guys uh, next next uh, next podcast. I'm all, we'll have an answer on that. That's a tough one. Yeah, because I mean, Chug – like I used to love when Chug would get in the games. So I'd be I'd be sitting there and I'd just yell, Chug, and it was well, just like he had his one he had his one shiny moment. He had a chance, man. He had he had a chance. What, it wasn't the Michigan game or something like that. He came in there. I think he had was he it? had one play. I think he had one play where he came in and had a chance to throw it, and uh, he he didn't get it done, man. Chug almost was a legend, but now. He's just a they, he's just a punchline to the Jagger Larue jokes on on a web on a podcast now. God, he had been signing if he had had that photo of, of throwing a touchdown in the shoe, he could have signed that at every gas station opening in Columbus for the next twenty years. What exactly. ex- what, what, what it could have been. So, all right, well, we're gonna wrap this thing up as always. Appreciate you guys. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Sue. You showed up tonight. Appreciate you guys as always for giving you crap, Sue. Appreciate uh, you know all you guys, the regulars showing up. Uh, if you want to know when we are rolling, click that alert button in YouTube and you'll get a little alert on your phone when we go live. Generally, it's about this time of night. Um, basketball game tomorrow. Uh, likely, uh, we'll try to get in before the uh, the game. Uh, so just kind of keep uh, keep your antenna out for us. Uh, click that like button on your way out. Click subscribe. Again, we appreciate you guys. Uh, we love interacting with you guys. You guys are the best. Uh, so we love doing this. If you guys enjoy this show... You guys want to do this all the time. BuckeyeScoop.com is the home of myself, Nevada Buck, and the great Bill the Bank Green, the best recruiting guy in the business. Uh, he's bringing fire content. Um, some of the big names Ohio State is taking big swings at right now. Some of these young guys that are interested in Ohio State. He's got a lot of big updates. He's going kind of position by position right now. Uh, he'll have big spring game updates, uh, some of the visitors. So super, super content coming on. Um, it's about to get cranked up. So you guys want us going on in spring practice? BuckeyeScoop.com is your spot because we are going to have our people at practice and we can't wait to tell you what is going on there. So we appreciate you guys. As always, thank you guys for tuning into the show. Uh, again, leave a like. It's a huge help for us. Helps us ride that YouTube algorithm wave. So thank you guys. Uh, and shout out where you're from in the comments. I want to know uh, where you guys are watching from. So as always, thank you so much, Buckeye Nation. 
Thank you, Scoop family. I will see you guys all on BuckeyeScoop.com for the best content involving all of Ohio State sports. Appreciate you guys. You guys have a great rest of your day. Go Bucks.